So I can't believe John gave me up like that, knowing that I can tell plenty of stories. <laughs> it's my uh, enormous misfortune to follow Ted Shaw in speaking, a fate I would not wish on my worst enemy. Um, and I hope that perhaps what I can do uh, in some small way is to offer you a little sense of the view on the ground. Because we've heard this morning about the legal view and the developments in legal doctrinal practices that surround immigration. And we've heard a very personal, in many ways, um, story about how this becomes part of the American experience and how we let all of these different ideas come to fruition in our minds during very troubled times. My experience leaving government, frankly, has been a difficult one because I resigned just moments before the inauguration of President Trump, um, words I still have some difficulty saying, and yet I continue to believe in the mission of the Justice Department and that we are combined as one America, and essentially when you're on an airplane, you've got to find some way to root for the pilot. So I hope that the work of the Justice Department over the next eight years, despite some concerns about leadership and a shaky start, will at the end of the day be part of the work that keeps us grounded in our values. So, so let me tell you a little bit about United States attorneys, because really we're very much um, behind the scenes. People don't know a lot about U.S. attorneys until we get fired. And so it wasn't until the George W. Bush administration when nine U.S. attorneys were fired for political reasons that most people even knew we existed. And, and again, recently we've seen Trump fire the 41 remaining Obama U.S. attorneys, and again there was a little bit of interest. Um, but let me talk with you a little bit about who we are and what we do. We've existed since the beginning of this country in all judicial districts. Currently there are 93 U.S. attorneys um, at any given time. This is trivia if you're ever on, on Jeopardy. There are actually 94 federal judicial districts, but Guam and the Mariana Islands share a U.S. attorney, so 93 of us. And it is so appropriate to talk about U.S. attorneys and their role in community protection and civil rights in the Jackson Center, because before he was Justice Jackson, he was Attorney General Jackson. And he held that role in the 1940s when it was still a wild west for U.S. attorneys. They were free agents. Uh, the interpretation of the law in California could be very different from the interpretation in Maine. And there were wildly different penalties and approaches across the country. And he sought to herd the cats, to pull all those powerful independent U.S. attorneys together, and to create some degree of national uniformity of purpose, of prosecution, of guideline, and to do that he summoned all of the U.S. attorneys to Washington, D.C. And he spoke to them as a group about shared values and the need for them to surrender not too much but some of their independence so that we could work together better as a group to ensure that justice in Oklahoma was the same as justice in Florida. That's a bit of the ongoing work of the department but so appropriate for me to talk about this here. By statute, U.S. attorneys have only three jobs. We enforce the criminal laws of the United States. We represent the United States in civil cases, cases involving money or other non-criminal aspects, and we collect money judgments on behalf of the United States. And that role has stayed fairly static um, over time. United States attorneys are not the president's lawyers. They are the people's lawyers. And the first time Barack Obama met with the U.S. attorneys uh, as a group in Washington, he said words that had forever stayed with me. And I wrote them down at the time because I was so fascinated. I actually wrote them down on a cocktail napkin um, that was in my purse. We were at the White House. And I learned later that virtually all of my colleagues had done the same thing. He said to us, I appointed you, but you don't serve me. You serve the American people. And I expect you to do that with integrity and with independence. And those were the words that stayed in our minds throughout our service. And we were in many ways a radical generation of United States attorneys because we worked for a radical boss, Eric Holder. When Eric hired me, when I was in his office for my interview and I said, you know, this is great, I'm really excited, what do you want me to do? 
and I had my notepad out. I thought it would be a laundry list. And Holder said, just do the right thing. And that was always the guidance that we got from him. So traditionally in the Justice Department, the metric for our work, and I'm a career prosecutor. I started as a line prosecutor, spent 10 years in the criminal division, worked in our appellate division, was the appellate chief um, for the last few years before I became U.S. attorney. And our metric was numbers. How many cases are you doing? I actually got a report that showed me how many cases I was indicting and what other people were indicting. And I always thought it was a little bit of a silly metric, but that really came home to me when we started working with Holder, who explicitly rejected the metric that as offices we should be evaluated based on whether we did more cases this year than we did last year. And instead, he suggested a different metric that I was only too happy to adopt. That metric was, is the work that you're doing as a U.S. attorney, is the work that in Birmingham your 54 prosecutors are doing, is that work making your community safer? And that question became the touchstone for evaluating what we did and what we didn't do. Because you have limited resources, there is a lot of crime writ large and then a lot of technical crime, and as U.S. Attorney, you have to determine where will you focus the relatively few resources you have? What should be a federal crime? What should be prosecuted? And what might not be behavior you would want to encourage, but behavior that you're simply not going to attack because you have other priorities. At the end of the day, you know, my assessment was I was not in the business of producing a widget, and I should not measure my production like a factory would. My product was justice. And so that was the approach that we took in Birmingham, um, something that I'm still very proud of. So it's an interesting balancing act because nothing that you do as a prosecutor and I suspect in life really happens in a vacuum, right? It's not just absolutely I'm going to keep my community safe. You have to do a little bit of a balancing act because I can certainly keep my community very safe, but that would force me to do things that are contrary to my understanding of my obligations under the Constitution and to the civil rights law in this country. And so anytime you hear law enforcement talking about safety, there's also this balance of rights. And prosecution is, I think, in many ways, art as much as it is science. And much of the art involves how do you balance these priorities that sometimes compete. My experience was that if you were doing it right, really they complemented each other. And they didn't have to be in competition. But that took, I think, some willingness to expand your views. Because as a young prosecutor, I was taught, and I'm confident every prosecutor in my generation was taught, that the way you kept the community safe was by arresting bad guys and locking them up for as long as you possibly could. And the data simply doesn't support that. Long sentences aren't the best way to make communities safe. And in many cases, we have over-criminalized and over-incarcerated whole generations of people in disparate ways. By that I mean that in the wealthy white suburbs of Birmingham, drug crime might go unnoticed, while in predominantly African American North Birmingham, it might result in lengthy sentencing. And so many of these considerations have to come together um, in the hands of folks when they're trying to think about prosecution. The, the last thing I'll say about U.S. attorneys before I talk a little bit about immigration, which I know is why we're here today, is that when you have leadership in the Justice Department that sets as its goal prosecuting lots of cases and fighting a war on a specific species of crime, prosecutors will try to get numbers of cases, and that means that they will pick low-hanging fruit. They will do the easiest cases. They will do the most accessible cases. They won't do the lengthy cases that take more time and more effort. So it's easy to do a low-level drug case or a felon in possession of a firearm case, which is a federal crime. It's much more difficult to go after a convoluted, lengthy investigation into financial fraud by a public figure. And what we really want in our justice system is a set of incentives that say, we protect our community the best when we do the most important cases, and we do them with a strong consciousness of people's civil rights. 
So what did that look like on the ground for us in Alabama? We did some things that were radically different. Prosecutors love to tell you that they are not social workers. And we're not. We don't have that training. We really don't know how to effectively work on behalf of victims or of witnesses. And there are folks who do that much better than we do it. But that simple statement, we're not social workers, had become an excuse. And we learned in so many ways that as much as our core responsibility was the enforcement part of the criminal justice system, we also had to work on prevention. We also had to work on, on behalf of people reentering the community from prison to help reduce the barriers that led them to reoffend if we were really going to keep our communities safe. And immigration became a fulcrum for much of the work that we did for the very simple reason that when you talk about people wanting to do numbers of cases and do numbers of cases that are perhaps easier and simpler to do, there was no better statute than the law that made it illegal for someone to reenter this country after being deported. It's a very simple statute. If you've previously been deported, it's a federal felony to reenter the country without the permission of the Attorney General. Virtually no one who's crossing the border illegally has that permission, probably no one. And so anytime any of these folks somehow or another became entangled with police authorities, they were referred to us through ICE for prosecution. And there were large numbers of cases along those lines done during the Bush administration. They were problematic for me and for many of my colleagues, and I put an immediate end to doing those cases willy-nilly in Birmingham because I thought that our obligation was to protect the community, and that meant focusing our resources on people who were in this country without status who were violent. We had a number of cases of people who had that kind of history, people with murders, with rapes, with armed robberies in their background. And we often didn't prosecute those cases because we had made no effort to prioritize. We just did whatever came in the door first. They were all the same to us. And so it became important for me to think about doing those cases as part of an overall community strategy for making us safer. And that made it clear that we had to do what was often the more difficult cases, but the cases that made us safer, and at the same time didn't do injustice to our sense of what needed to be done. I will tell you that you will sometimes hear folks criticizing the Obama administration for failing to enforce the law. And the reality is this. There are a lot of laws on the books that we do not enforce. Most of them in Alabama, which is known for silly laws about dancing with your dog on a Sunday night. Um, <laughs> but the reality is that prosecutors are in the business of selectively enforcing the law. We have limited resources. Congress gives us money. They gives up, give us numbers of prosecutors. And we have to pick and choose. And it was, I think, a smart choice on criminal side immigration law to um, work in this way. But the much more interesting part of our immigration work happened outside of the criminal realm. And I'll just talk with you briefly about two experiences that I had. Alabama, you may be surprised to learn, has a relatively large Muslim immigrant population. In Tuscaloosa and in Birmingham, the universities have brought in diverse communities, uh, multi-ethnic communities, and communities that primarily were not in touch with law enforcement. Uh, many of them American citizens, many not citizens, permanent residents, not everyone in the community here with legal status. And early in the Obama administration, we identified a gap in civil rights protections in the Muslim community. And U.S. attorneys in 17 districts, including mine, were asked to pilot outreach into those communities. So I went to my FBI SAC, the special agent in charge in Birmingham, a great guy, and said, Rick, I need to go talk to our Muslim community. Where's our Muslim community? And he said, oh, don't worry, I've got this covered. There are two mosques, one's in Birmingham, one's in Huntsville. We interact with them, we know everything. You don't really need to get involved. But I was a good soldier and I'd been given my marching orders. Um, so my friend Google and I spent some time together. And I learned that there were actually five mosques in Alabama, those two large mosques, another large mosque in Tuscaloosa, 
two smaller mosques populated almost exclusively by doctors in the cities of Gadsden and Anniston. There were also active student groups at many of our major colleges and universities, and there was a large Sikh temple in Little Bessemer, Alabama, halfway between Birmingham and Tuscaloosa, so those communities could pray together. It was important to reach out to Sikhs because Sikh men who wear turbans are often mistaken for Muslims and had been the target of violence after 9-11. And so I brought my team together and said, we're going to go out and visit the Muslim community. And I was um, met with uh, maybe some folks who weren't really thrilled uh, about doing that and thought we had other work to do and didn't know why we were going to do this. But we set out a group of us to meet with the leadership of the mosque in Birmingham. And you need to know a little bit about me to understand just how unusual this was because I'm a Jewish girl from Los Angeles. Um, I married my law school sweetheart. I've lived in Birmingham for almost 30 years now. But at heart, you know, I'm still a Jewish girl from L.A., and so I was about to walk into a mosque, and I wondered what my reception would be like. And it was a warm reception. Um, we had to get to know each other at first, like you always have to. And there was enormous concern in the Muslim community at this point in time in 2009, 2010, about FBI surveillance of activities in mosques and this effort to criminalize and demonize um, the entire uh, Muslim religion in this country. So it was important for us walking in to say, you know, we're not here about terrorism. That's a, a topic. It's a topic for another day. It's not a topic for today. We're concerned about your civil rights. Our job is to let you know what your rights are, what we can do to protect them, and to make sure that you know how to get in touch with us. And they obviously had to get to know us a little bit better and have a comfort level to understand that that was really why we were there. But we built that relationship in the five mosques and with our student groups over time. And they had never before as a community felt like they could come to us for advice. It was little things at first. A problem with a bank that was putting holds on transfers that didn't need to have a hold on them. And so we interfaced with the bank. There was an issue with how Muslim prisoners in Alabama's prisons were being treated. And we were able to bring the head of the Department of Corrections to the table with some of the Muslim leaders so they could work that out. There was no place for Muslims to pray in the Birmingham airport. And the few of them who were obligated to um, perform one of their five-day ritual prayers while waiting in the airport had experienced some problems. And again, we were able to work with the community. And over time, that relationship developed into something enormously special. Early on as U.S. attorney, I learned that four years before, a Muslim man in Tuscaloosa had been shot by an attacker who called Muslim slurs as he fired the gun. And that was never reported to our office. And by the time we got wind of it, it was almost too late. We did some work around the edges, but for procedural reasons, we couldn't really do anything with that situation. The community began to feel like they could come to us and talk with us about civil rights violations. And that was important to me, even though there wasn't a statistic attached to it. And at the end of the day, there came a time when leadership of the mosque came to me and said, we have a concern about someone in our community who we think is engaging in criminal conduct. And we feel like we can trust you and share this with you. And in fact, they brought something to our attention that could have been incredibly risky to the safety of our community and perhaps um, other communities. Had they not done so, it resulted in a now public criminal prosecution of a young Uzbeki man who had overstayed his passport and hatched a plot to um, assassinate the president. And we were able, because the community trusted us and we could work together, to arrest him um, after he made the effort to acquire a machine gun and some hand grenades. So it was a serious threat, and it was a criminal case. But because we understood that the community was not a community of criminals, it was just people like us who wanted to raise their kids, we were able to work together on both civil rights and the protection of the community. In virtually every mosque at some point in our relationship, I had the same conversation with someone there. They said, you know, you're the first U.S. attorney who's ever come to us, and you're really not what we expected. 
And we um, appreciated that and had to share with them that, that we too, you know, had not expected the warmth of the relationship that would develop. But at the end of the day, our obligation was to protect the entire community, not just the parts of the community that were accessible to us. And that leads me to the last piece about immigration I'll share with you. In 2011, the Alabama legislature passed HB 56, which I lovingly refer to as the Alabama Deport Yourself Hispanic Immigrants Bill. Um, it was far angrier than the Arizona bill, which the Justice Department was already challenging. It had provisions that were designed to keep school children out of school. And the Supreme Court has held in a case called Plyler versus Doe that whether you're an American citizen or not, you've got a right to a K through 12 education. Well, Alabama had decided to essentially do away with that right for school children by requiring that they provide information on their parents' status as immigrants when they registered for school. Statute forced local police, many of whom were up in arms about it, to become immigration enforcers, and they didn't want to do that. And it also made it illegal for folks who were doing volunteer work through churches and other religious entities to transport people who did not have legal status to doctor's appointments and other meetings. And so the church groups weren't real happy about this law either. But the sad truth about HB 56 was that it was passed with overwhelming support in the supermajority Republican Alabama legislature and the community, business community, leaders, folks who I would have expected to be up in arms really weren't. As a U.S. attorney, my quibble with the law going back to our conversation this morning was that it violated the preemption clause. Yeah. It's very clear from the Constitution that policy on immigration is set in Washington. And that's an obvious sort of thing for us to understand. You can't ask a country to deal, a foreign country, to deal with a patchwork quilt of 50 states' different primary top-level immigration policies. So early on, I knew that we wanted to take the very unusual step, in fact, the first time my office had ever challenged um, an Alabama state law on constitutionality grounds. But we really needed some voices in the community that would go along with that, and they just weren't, weren't emerging. And so I convened a meeting of civil rights stakeholders in our communities. As you might imagine, in Birmingham, that's a large and diverse group, ranging from um, Asian immigrants who've come in as the car companies have established factories in Alabama, the Muslim community, we have a, obviously a, a growing Hispanic community, folks in the African American community, disability advocates, folks in the LGBTQ community, folks from the religious community. And we had a large room full of people seated around a, ta seated around a table, and I began to talk about the bill and ask whether people had concerns, and no one was really speaking up. There is a wonderful judge, now a retired judge in Birmingham, the first African-American judge that we had in our federal district court named UW Clemen. And UW signified that he wanted to speak. And he was quiet for a moment. He gathered his thoughts in this wonderful way that he had. And then he looked around the room at everyone and he said, Brown is the new black. He said, we didn't fight in the 60s for ourselves just to walk away from this fight. And to this day, I'm tremendously grateful for his words, for his support. He actually came along in the case as a lawyer representing some of the religious institutions. And we did challenge HB 56 in court. We did it successfully, although not until we reached the 11th Circuit. And what that has to say about the role that U.S. attorneys can play, I think is very simply this. The civil division in my office and in most of the U.S. attorneys' offices in the Deep South did not have a track record of doing plaintiffs' civil litigation. We did defensive work. We represented the United States when it got sued. And one of my colleagues from our appellate division actually worked on the case with me, which I handled personally, with our fabulous colleagues in the Civil Rights Division and in the Civil Division in Washington. 
and we mounted this first time challenge. Our bench was stunned, and a lot of the judges said to me, what, are, are you running a plaintiff civil rights law firm in the United States Attorney's Office? And I said, yes. Yes, because that's what our mission has to be. And increasingly, whether that's work that we did on behalf of the LGBT community or work we did for Americans with disabilities or civil rights cases on behalf of veterans, that is our work. And it was embodied in the work that we did on behalf of Hispanic immigrants in Alabama during the HB 56 litigation. Um, I had the great good fortune to work for an attorney general who gave me the latitude to do that. That support, which was replicated across the country in all 93 districts, enabled an entire generation of U.S. attorneys to re-envision their work so that rather than judging ourselves based on the number of cases that we were doing, we were looking at the impact that they had on the people who we worked for. So, Justice Jackson, I think I started by telling you, made the seminal speech, the touchstone speech, that when U.S. attorneys are talking with each other about what's our job, what's our obligation, how do we relate with our communities, it's what we all refer back to. And I think it's appropriate to close with his words. He told the assembled U.S. attorneys in 1940 that prosecutors have their authority because we as a country want crime eliminated. But we want that done while the best in American traditions are preserved. He said, while you're being diligent and strict and vigilant, you can still be just. You can still be just. And those are the words that we all carried forward with us in our tenure. When I resigned as U.S. Attorney, I took on the most important job I suspect I'll ever have, the job of being a private citizen. And I think all of our job now in a somewhat difficult era as private citizens is to make sure that we hold this next generation of U.S. attorneys and prosecutors and other government officials, that we hold them accountable to Justice Jackson's charge, that they be just. Thank you.